Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 77 of the Healthy Gut Podcast and today we are joined by the wonderful Kirsten Swales and we are going to be talking all around a uh, what the high fat diets look like, LCHF, you might have heard that terminology. So Kirsten is a naturopath, a nutritionist, a medical herbalist and she runs uh, an online support system really focusing on digestive health and with a focus on SIBO. And she's also a motivational speaker in this regard. Now, not only does she have this amazing range of qualifications, but she's also experienced SIBO herself. So she knows firsthand what it's like to be living with digestive discomfort. So welcome to the show, Kirsten. It's great to have you on the Healthy Gut Podcast today. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. Now, first first things first, I always love to start off with asking, you know, how you got into doing what you're doing and your own personal experience with, with SIBO. I think it's always great to to know, you know, how you know about this so intimately. <laughs> yep. I think I've heard you say before that you probably popped out the womb with digestive issues and I think I feel the same. So throughout my whole life, I was always very aware of my digestive system. I was always very aware of my tummy without really understanding why. So it was very easy for me to gain weight. It was very easy for me to feel tired. And I learned from a really early age that food hurt. So then that kind of kicked off a negative negative relationship with food. And I often just felt better if I didn't eat. So I'd go for days without eating anything just so I could avoid the pain and the cramping. And I could never understand how I got fat so quick. Like one day I'd have this lovely flat stomach, the next day I looked pregnant. So I wasn't actually getting fat, I was getting bloated. There's a difference between the two. And so then the universe kind of helped me out with my calling because I kind of fell into naturopathy just from a desire to feel better than I currently did. Because I was doing all the right things. I was quite active as a child, playing all the sports. I was into healthy eating. I had a very happy disposition, but I always felt tired and I felt like it was more of a struggle than it should be to stay healthy and slim. So then I began studying in 2008 and I adopted a vegetarian diet for a little while, which was touted as the most healthful diet that there was. It was a disaster for me. Again, I put on loads of weight, which is probably inflammation. So I was always very bloated. I was always very puffy. I got really tired, my skin broke out, my joints were stiff, and it was so frustrating because I was doing all the right things, but nothing was helping. And so then a couple of years after that, I stumbled on this weight loss protocol, which was really, really cool. And I lost loads of weight, felt really great. And from day three, it was the first time in my life that I could remember not feeling bloated. And hindsight, now that I know what I know about SIBO and FODMAPs and all these different foods, the foods that were really encouraged to follow on this diet were all really low FODMAP, which is why I felt so good. So then following that, I transitioned onto a low-carb, high-fat diet, continued to feel really, really good. Um, Energy was amazing. My skin was glowing. I was just full of beans all the time. It was absolutely amazing. Then in 2015, I moved to Bali, where I still live. I absolutely love it. And after about six weeks of arriving here, I started getting more bloated. I started to get a little bit tired. I started to get sore joints. And I was a yoga instructor at the time, so I so used to be so flexible. I could hardly touch my toes, which could be the inflammation. And so then doing some more research and something that a friend said, I was like, oh, what if I've got SIBO? And so research, research, research. I ordered a test kit from SIBO Test in Australia, and my hydrogen numbers were off the charts. They literally didn't even fit on the form, which surprised me because back then I was prone to constipation more than I was diarrhea, which is the opposite of what you'd expect from the test results because usually it's the methanogens that cause the constipation. So then about the next two weeks after that diagnosis, I was just in such a tailspin and I pretty much locked myself away in my room and just research, research, research. 
on one hand, it was devastating to get the result, but on the other hand, I was like, oh my gosh, I finally know what's up with all these symptoms and this is something that I can deal with and this is something that I can heal and I actually have a shot of feeling good without trying as hard as I had been all the time. I think one mistake that I did make in hindsight was jumping into all the Facebook groups. So (laughs) in these Facebook groups, there's a lot of people that aren't seeking professional help and they might be following protocols that have helped Susie or Jane or Eric, but it might not be appropriate for them. So I was seeing all these people that just were not getting better. How old was I then? I was 32 at the time. And I was like, oh my gosh, my life is over. I'm never going to be able to have a normal meal at a restaurant. I'm never going to be able to date. I also lost my period as a result of getting the SIBO. I said, and I have a huge dream to have a family. I was like, I'm never going to have my family. And I was, I was absolutely devastated. Then more research, and I booked an appointment with Dr. Jason Horolak just to kind of get – so I had a plan – Um, because I really had, at that stage, maybe five years of naturopathic knowledge, but I didn't feel like it was enough. I wanted guidance from someone that was a couple of steps ahead of me. So I went to Jason with, okay, this is what I think I'm doing, and he talked me through it and just kind of uncrossed some of the wires that I had going wrong. And I actually did a combination of water fasting, elemental diet, like you've just done, and then also did some antimicrobials and herbals. I consider myself pretty quick in terms of SIBO, so I actually got a negative test result within three months, which is absolutely amazing. But then I had to spend the next year after that healing my relationship with food because I got stuck into a – because I've been so restricted for so long, like the foods are really restricted and in the height of my SIBO because I had to reduce, reduce, reduce the foods that I was eating to avoid these symptoms, I was pretty much down to eating chicken and eggs. So that was really bad for my microbiome, and it was also not really good for my mind. So then I had to do lots of emotional work to heal that relationship with food. And I'm really good now. So I'm happy with my body. I'm happy with myself. I hardly ever get bloating. So I'm feeling really, really good. So it is totally possible to heal from SIBO. The times it takes for everyone will be different, but it's definitely possible. What's really great, I think, for, you know, us mere mortals is to hear a practitioner talk about their own experience and their own experience around the fear around food. Mm. That's something that I experienced myself. It's something I see really commonly amongst the SIBO community. And like you said, it's when we are self-restricting our foods. We're not working with, you know, someone that is really experienced with SIBO. And it's really interesting how even though you're a naturopath, you've got a whole heap of qualifications, you went and sought the services of somebody who was more experienced in in this field. And I think that's a really important point to make that, you know, you're not just a lay person, you have Uh, training and education in this area and you still sought additional help with this and so I think it's really important for just you know the people like myself we don't have medical or any other training under our belt but we can't be expected to know everything there is about a really complex condition and to then be able to solve it so that's really great to hear that you you uh you know, you were able to recognise that and, yeah, and go on sure. and get the help. And that's fantastic to hear that your SIBO, you've been able to clear your SIBO, you got a negative breath test so quickly. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is a very quick turnaround for quick. a SIBO breath test. Yeah. And uh, and that you're feeling great today and you're eating more diverse foods. So yeah. yay for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy. So that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. And and before we move into the low carb, high fat diet, because that's what we're here to talk about. I also um, appreciate the comment that you made around those big Facebook Mm. groups. And I hear from people frequently who are newly diagnosed. They've stumbled across me through my podcast, through the website, through my um, social media platform. And then they go into the big groups Mm. and it is shocking to them because people are very quick to post about the negatives they're not very quick to post about the positives and it is overwhelming when you get into those groups because it is doom and gloom I would say 95% of the posts and 
I had to restrict myself from those groups in my early days. I found them overwhelmingly emotionally upsetting. I'm very empathetic empathetic to people and their emotions. And so I found myself taking on board the worries of the world because I was seeing these quite dramatic posts. And it's not to discount these people. When they're posting that, they're feeling miserable. Um, but like you said, I think in many situations, people are either unwilling or unable to work with a practitioner who is skilled with SIBO. And I, I really believe in investing in our health with people who are experienced. I would rather spend my money wisely. I don't have a bottomless pit of money, but I now consult with a doctor in the States who's incredible, Dr. Jason Wysocki, and, and I save up to have appointments with him so that I can get a new pair of eyes looking over my case. And that's because I want the best of the best looking after me. And we do that via Skype. So whilst he doesn't treat me because I'm not there in person with him, uh, he's able to consult and then I can work with my local naturopath on, on various treatments. So to, to those of you who are listening who think, well, I've got no one near me, don't let that stop you. There are people that are offering online services to give you assistance to help you get through where you are today because we all want people to yeah, be feeling a lot better. Really so I'm <laughs> get off my soapbox now that no, I've said really that, but I really, it really upsets yeah. me seeing how many people are suffering and, uh, and yeah. not getting Yeah, and there's the also the there. cost versus the value. So an appointment with a naturopath might be $200, but the value that you can get from that is getting your life back. And then also, if you go and see someone that is experienced, we can help you tell you exactly what you should do in which order, and then you'll probably save yourself so much money in the long run because you're not trying this, trying that. And you might even be doing the right thing, but maybe not in the right doses or in the right order. So you can, and time is our most precious value. So saving yourself time and you can get back to life. So that's really good. Exactly. I see it as an investment. I don't see it as an expense. I re-divert my funds. I don't have a bottomless pit. So I make a conscious decision on what I'm wanting to spend my money on. And for me, it's my health. Because I know that once I have my health, I have anything else I want in the world. So it's an investment into my future self. And it's much, I think, it is much better for us to invest in seeing a really good doctor today than waste time, money, energy, effort and our lives with a half-hearted, not intentionally bad, but a doctor that's not the right fit for you. So that's my approach. Now let's talk about diet because diet is such a big thing when it comes to SIBO and once you get into this world, you hear about all the different diets and it, we, and there's so many and they, often they contradict each other and it causes a lot of angst. But we're here today to talk about the low-carb, high-fat diet or LCHF as it's often known. You might have seen hashtag LCHF. Uh, so first things first, what is low-carb, high-fat? Right, so low-carb, high-fat. Um, actually, before we even go there, I want to say with any kind of diet that you're following or any kind of restrictive thing that you're following, focus on all the good things that you can have rather than thinking about all the things that you can't have. It's such a shift in mindset and it becomes so much more enjoyable. And I, fear, I share your belief that SIBO diets don't have to be boring. You can get so excited. There's so many good foods out there. So just putting that in first. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's very true. And and also what works for me doesn't work for you. And just because it's listed on a diet protocol doesn't mean it's right for you. So you've really got to play around with what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And I think that yeah. can be so just watch challenging it. for some But low carb, high fat. So just to make the distinction, it doesn't mean that you're eating loads of fat. It just means that the, the content of fat that you're eating is higher in ratio compared to the carbohydrates that you're eating. Um, and so then fat is the most caloric dense macronutrient out of them. So our macronutrients are our proteins, our fats, and our carbohydrates. For every one gram of protein, for every one gram of carbohydrates, you get four kilocalories. For every one gram of fat, you get nine kilocalories. 
So it's a lot more calorie dense. So on a plate, it might actually look quite small, but it makes up most of your calorie intake when you follow a low carb, high fat way of eating. So let's talk about the types of fats then. What would we be eating in a low carb, high fat diet? Mm. Are this, is this just slabs <laughs> of butter and gallons of olive so oil? So when we do it where, right, where are these so fats coming good ways from? to be a vegetarian, there's bad ways to be a vegetarian. Same with low carb, high fat. So we talk about the good fats and the bad fats. So the good fats would be your omega-3 fatty acids, which can include your olive oil, can include flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds. Uh, you get them in your fatty fish like salmon. Olives are great. Avocados are great. Coconut oil and coconut. Those sorts of foods are the, the good kinds of fat. But also butter if you do okay with dairy because this can be really good for our butyrate production, which is in our gut. It's individual on dairy. I try not to have too much dairy because it is inflammatory to the digestive system. But every now and again, I do enjoy it. Yeah, oh, butter is so yummy. <laughs> and mm, I find that I, I, know. I can tolerate butter way better than I can do- tolerate milk or soft cheeses, for instance. And I find normally that my dairy intake is limited to butter, ghee, and the occasional bit of cheese. Um, I, yeah, I don't consume a lot of dairy. That would be because of the lactose content. So in 10 grams of butter, there might only be one gram of lactose, whereas in dairy it would be much, much, much higher. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we've talked about some of the fats that you can include. What are the fats that we should be staying away from? So these would be a lot of the omega-6 fatty acids. So we want to have an almost equal ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. Most of the time for someone that's following an upgrade diet, the omega-6s are quite high. And these are the pro-inflammatory fatty acids. And they include a lot of your seed vegetable oils like soybean oil, canola oil, the ones that – and because these are a problem because they can oxidize when we heat them. And then when they oxidize, they turn rancid. And then that causes inflammation in the body. And then I think it goes without saying things like ice cream is not so great and deep fried things aren't so great. And are there, you know, what, so if we've been used to cooking with vegetable oils, for, for instance, um, and we want to make a change, we're like, oh, okay, I didn't realise that that isn't great for me. What oils should we be cooking with? Coconut oil is hands down my favourite. So it's got a really high burning point and a really high smoke point, which means that it does, so the, all the molecules in this coconut oil don't turn rancid until a really, really, really high temperature. And then think, talking on that, so olive oil is an amazing uh, anti-inflammatory oil, but we don't want to use it for cooking because it's got a very low burning, burning point and a very low smoke point. So even though it's a healthy oil, if you use it for cooking, it can turn rancid, it can cause the inflammation. Also, if it's been in the cupboard for a while and it smells a bit funky, it's it's gone. Yeah. And what about, um, so if you can't tolerate coconut, and I know amongst the SIBO community there are plenty of people that are just like, Coconut is the devil. Don't bring it anywhere near me. <laughs> what about things like homemade tallow and homemade lard? Are they, I, I, I make them myself and use them frequently. What's your views on well, them as a cooking That's amazing. Oil? No, they're great. And then also ghee because ghee, ghee is clarified butter, so it's got very, very, very little lactose in it. So this can often be good for SIBO people as well. And, again, it's got the high burning point, so that can be good too. And it tastes delicious as well. Yeah, I love, I love making my tallow and lard, and I uh, have this great. Uh, we we get a pack of beautiful pork from a pork farmer uh, here in Australia uh, every month, and I um, we just asked for some fat so that I could render my own uh, lard, and so I've just done that. So I've got this huge slab of lard sitting there, ready for me to cook with. I've just done the same with some beautiful. Um, organic grass-fed beef fat that I got from my organic butcher and I I find that it uh, really imparts a lovely flavour to the dishes, just adds to the complexity of the flavour in the dishes and I now use that for any time if I'm, let's say I'm stir-frying something, I'll pick the fat that matches the meat um, or will match the flavour of the dish I'm trying to go for. So I'll use my tallow, which is from beef, in more of my beef and red meat dishes. 
I'll often use my lard for my chicken. Oh, and my you're making me hungry. <laughs> And it's so easy to do. And I'll just tell the people that are listening today how to do it because it is literally easy peasy. You get your fat, you can ask your butcher to mince it or dice it really finely. I just chop it up. Um, When it's really cold, put it in a food processor just to blitz it and to help kind of break the fat down. And then if you've got a slow cooker, I just put it in my slow cooker with nothing else on the lowest setting and then it, it all the fat renders out of the, the chunks over, say, four or five-hour period. You'll then be left with some crispy things. Um, my dog thinks they're the best crispy things he's ever eaten in his life. He gets a little <laughs> treat when I'm making my fat. And then you strain it off um, into a sterile jar or I've been putting it in a tin, in a cake tin, and so it's making slabs like bars of butter. And then you just keep it in the fridge and it's fantastic. It lasts for ages. It costs very little because they often don't charge you for the fat or they charge you next to nothing when you get it from your butcher because it's they'll just throw it out anyway. Um, so it's an economical way of making really good quality saturated fat that you can cook with. Yeah, that's so great. I love all your recipes. And it's so nice making it from scratch as well because then you know what's in it. Um, that's really, really good. And you can make it in bulk yeah. and it can save time. It's just sometimes it can be a switch in your mindset around food. And then once you get into the groove, it's so good. One of the things just talking about that switch in mindset that I had to go through was uh, I had been indoctrinated in the um, low fat movement of the 80s. I went to Weight Watchers many times over in an attempt to lose weight. I was absolutely petrified of fat. I used to cut every little ounce of fat off my meat I still have to really work at the textural issues around fat I'm you know I'm, I'm a lot better than I used to be but you know still to me I, I conditioned myself so strongly over those you know probably a 25 year period to avoid fat that you know still texturally it can be a bit of a challenge but the moment I started increasing the amount of fat good quality fat that I brought into my diet, I literally felt amazing almost overnight. And I could see that for all these years where I'd had such a low fat, high carbohydrate and, and therefore high sugar diet, I was just doing my body such a disservice. So it can take time to bring in a higher fat diet. And what I did was I picked the foods that I liked the best. So I didn't go for higher fat foods that I really didn't like because, and from a flavor profile or a texture profile, because then I would have just not got anywhere with it. But instead I did things like I started eating the skin on roast chicken or I started having some avocado because I loved avocado. I love butter. So I was having a bit of butter or I was putting butter on my steamed vegetables And slowly but surely I upped the fat intake until now I'm definitely in that LCHF um, zone. Cool, that sounds good. So I was probably the opposite. I've always loved the taste of fat, but because I was indoctrinated that it was not good for us, I was always very ashamed for eating it. So I had a lot of food shame kind of growing up. My grandpa even called me a guzzle guts and I was like, oh, when I, I would love to have a daughter. When I have a daughter, I am not going to comment on body if it's good or bad or whatever. Because I think that's a really important thing to feel good in our bodies. It's one of my big missions is that everyone feels good in their body. Everybody has good self-worth and self-love is just natural. Yeah, sounds like a great plan. So let's talk about the difference between the low-carb, high-fat and ketogenic diets. Are they the same? Are they different? Very similar. It's just the amounts of carbohydrates that you would have. So on a ketogenic diet, on a low-carb, high-fat diet, it's there's like an ultimate goal as it is in a ketogenic diet so to go on a ketogenic diet it's got the goal of going into ketosis which is a metabolic process to get the body burning fat for fuel instead of glucose because they'll always choose glucose first that's the most easily converted form of energy but in ketosis it starts to burn the fat for fuel because you're restricting the carbohydrates so much that there isn't enough glucose so then it can turn into ketosis 
And then there's different amounts for different people, but say the maximum amount of carbohydrates per day on a ketogenic diet would probably be 50 grams of carbohydrates, which isn't very much. I think in a, to give an example of what that would look like in an apple, there might be 30 grams of carbohydrates. So, and then for some people, it can be 30 grams. For some people, it's even as low as 20 grams of carbohydrates which is, can be beneficial in the short term, but in the long term, I don't think that's very good for our bodies and I don't think it's very good for our microbiome because you can't get in that many veggies for 20 grams of carbohydrates. No, exactly. So one of my next questions was going to be, what are the pros and cons of a low-carb, high-fat diet? Sure. So we've talked about one of the potential cons, but yeah. let's start with the positives. Yeah. What's a good, what are the good <laughs> elements of it? I think the, the number one thing is that you'll probably feel really satisfied with your meals because it's the most satiating nutrients out of the macronutrients. And what I mean by that, so say with carbohydrates, these tend to pass through the stomach within... 20 minutes to an hour and then protein might take two to three hours to pass through fat can take five to six hours so you just feel more satisfied and you don't really get so hungry I once did an experiment I was I love to experiment on myself I opened up my fridge and I took everything that was high fat and I had some Greek yogurt I had some avocado I had some coconut yogurt I had a whole bunch of stuff and I made the smoothie which was probably only about 300 mils and then I but there were 700 calories in this 300 mils because everything was so high fat. And I had that around 2 p.m. And then dinner time was at 7 p.m. And I still wasn't hungry. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So that would be one of the biggest pros, I would say. And then it also helps to regulate blood sugar levels. So and it also helps to bring down insulin. So insulin is one of our hormones that helps to kind of carry the glucose to the cells and to our bloodstream. So we don't release insulin when we eat fat. So it can help to stabilize blood sugars in that way. So if you're someone that spikes every two hours, you're probably a sugar burner and you're used to burning those carbohydrates, whereas having fat will keep your blood sugar levels stable so you don't need to eat so often. Which would lead me into my next pro because then that makes proper meal spacing easier. And, which, and meal spacing is really good for our migrating motor complex. And the migrating motor complex is often not working so great into when we have SIBO. So this is the migrating motor complex is the sweeping wave that pushes through the intestine every 90 minutes and pushes food through. But every time we eat, the migrating motor complex stops, which makes sense because we need to digest the food that we put in our stomach. So if we can get that four to five hours between meals, that's so much time to push everything through the small intestine, get it away from the little SIBOs, and then your digestion works much better. What else is another pro? It's really good for hormones. But this can also be a con as well, which I'll come to. So making sure you have the right kinds of fat because we need cholesterol to build our hormones. It's one of the basic nutrients. Pros, it can also be very good for our nervous system. So the nervous system is all the little nerve fibers. They're enclosed in something called the myelin sheath. And a good way to get a visual is if you imagine electrical, electrical fibers, they're often enclosed in the rubber casing. That keeps them from fraying and sparking and being a little bit oversensitive. Same with our nervous system. When we have a nice, healthy myelin sheath, the nerve fibers conduct much more efficiently. I think those are my biggest, my biggest pros. <laughs> <laughs> from my own personal experience with, with really changing the way I eat, going from quite a high-carb, therefore high-sugar diet I could not get more than about two hours between my meals. I constantly snacked. So I'd have breakfast, a mid-morning snack, lunch, a mid-afternoon snack, sometimes two. And particularly in the mid-afternoon, I would have such an energy crash. I would be exhausted. I'd literally feel like I was at the depth of the ocean and unable to drag myself to the surface. Um, I, that, then I'd reach for something really sugary to give me that spike. Uh, when I could tolerate caffeine, which I haven't been able to for some time now, but I'd then have a really strong caffeinated drink as well to kind of perk myself up. I'd have dinner and then I'd have a big craving for something sweet before bedtime. So I ate all the time. Now, today I was smiling as you were talking about your high fat smoothie. Um, as I've been reintroducing foods and I've been following the GAPS protocol roughly, uh, so I've been having a lot of um, broths and adding fat to the food. 
So I had, uh, I was up at about 6.30 this morning. I then um, didn't eat. I just wasn't hungry. And I find when I'm having a higher fat intake, I'm just, I just don't get the hunger like I used to. So I ate a bowl of my beef soup, which has lots of fat in it because I cooked with really good fatty bones, but also the meat that I added to the soup was quite fatty and I left all of the fat on. So I had a bowl of my soup, which had lots of veggies in it, the broth and the beef, well-cooked beef, and that was at 9 a.m. And then I didn't eat again till 3 p.m. today. Um, and I, I ate just before we got on to our call. So that was a six-hour window where I didn't even think about food. The old I know, not, it's could so not nice. done that. Yeah. And the other big change for me yeah. is I no longer get hangry. So I used to be nasty and I remember traveling around Asia in my early 20s with my then boyfriend and he made a comment that he didn't like it when we were traveling for hours and I couldn't eat because I was not pleasant to be around whereas now I just don't get that it's it's a stable calm place in in the Rebecca body (laughs) oh gosh another massive pro is weight loss a lot of people lose weight when they adopt a low-carb high-fat diet And one of these things is because it doesn't come down to willpower, like your body just doesn't want it. You're naturally not hungry for hours at a time, so you're not constantly fighting against yourself. So great. What about for people that are underweight? And this is common amongst the SIBO community. There's people like me that gain a lot of weight, but there seems to be more people that are underweight. Uh, And if, if they've heard that and they're like, oh, my gosh, I couldn't do higher fat because if I lose weight, I can't afford to lose any more weight. Um, How does that work for people? That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We're back in a moment. for people that are underweight and this is common amongst the SIBO community there's people like me that gain a lot of weight but there seems to be more people that are underweight Uh, and if, if they've heard that and they're like oh my gosh I couldn't do higher fat because if I lose weight I can't afford to lose any more weight um how does that work for people You can do it one of two ways. I've had a few clients that have been underweight as well. So either you need a lot more calories. So if I say someone, I'm five foot eight, so I need about 2,000 calories a day to maintain my weight. Sometimes people need about 4,000, even 5,000 calories to maintain weight. And that's quite easy to do with fat because it's so uh, calorie dense. And then another way, it would be to make sure that you're having your carbs and your fat together and quite high amounts of carbs because when we eat the carbohydrates, that breaks down into the glucose. Every time we get the glucose, we need the insulin to deal with that glucose and insulin is the fat storing hormone. So that'll help you keep on the weight. So that could look like, say, some sweet potato drizzled in coconut oil and that can help to keep the weight on. Mm. What are some um, carbohydrate foods then for the SIBO community, for those people that are underweight, desperately trying to put weight on, if they're wanting to move to this? Um, let's say they're not quite at the potato stage yet. Um, what are some other vegetables that they could consider? So I know you just said vegetables, but I'm just going to go to jasmine rice. So that can be, it's almost always very well tolerated because it's very low in fiber. So that you can add, you can make, you can add that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can make rice pudding in the morning with cinnamon, which would help to stabilize blood sugars, drizzle that in some ghee or some coconut oil. Then the vegetables, if you, if you want to do it low carb, then it might not be so appropriate because it's going to be the starchy ones that help to keep on the weight like the sweet potato. Sure, higher quantities of, I would say. Because the vegetables that we want on the low-carb, high-fat way tend to be, it's a very general rule of thumb. You can think about the vegetables that grow above the ground. So that could be your all your dark green leafy veg. That can be the brassica family, like your broccoli, cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, cabbage. 
And then you also get your zucchini. Well, zucchini is a form of squash, so that could be quite good. And that tends to be quite well tolerated on SIBO. And then from all those I've listed, if you're familiar with the biphasic diet, it's actually a lot of the same vegetables. So that works quite well. Yeah, it is. I love rice pudding and kind of ricey sweet treats. And if I was wanting to put on weight, which I'm not, uh, I would be going great guns at rice pudding in the morning and rice pudding in the evening and I'd be having rice with my meals. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Have you ever tried cooking your rice in coconut milk? Yes. So yes. Good. Oh, yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there are all the positives. What are some of the um, perhaps not so positives of, of going on a high fat diet? I'd say the biggest one, because I'm like, oh my gut specialist, is, specialized, is starving your microbiome. So I think that was one mistake that I made when I stumbled onto the low carb, high fat. As it became trickier and trickier to maintain my weight, I started reducing my carbs more and more and more and more, increasing my fat and fat and fat. So I still looked good. Like at the time, teaching yoga, surfing most days, I had this little six pack, but it became harder to maintain that. So reducing my carbohydrates and what I think I did was painted myself into a corner with my microbiome because we need the different kinds of fibers from the carbohydrates, from the plant foods to feed our good bacteria. So fiber is the indigestible part of a plant food. And then different kinds of fibers feed different kinds of bacteria. We talk about acumansia, that's like the new big shot of our microbiome, and they need the carbohydrates. And on that as well, there's certain kinds of bacteria which are called the gram-negative bacteria, and these ones aren't usually so good, it's like your proteobacteria. And the reason why they aren't so good is because when they are happy and fed and well, in their shell, which is like the outer casing of their little bodies, they contain something called lipopolysaccharides, which is LPS. And these lipopolysaccharides are content, considered endotoxins. So endo means within. So when they're happy and fed, and then when they die, they release these lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream. And that's really inflammatory to the digestive system. So it worsens, and, and most people with SIBO probably have some degree of leaky gut. So then there's this release of the lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream, which causes inflammation body-wide. And then just like the gut barrier, we also have the blood-brain barrier. So this can become leaky as well. So it's not too well known, but like leaky, what's it called, leaky brain? I think I've heard people call it. And so then if the inflammation gets into the brain, we can feel that depressed and we can feel anxious. So it's not always, so depression is not always a thing with the nervous system or the adrenal system. It can be as a result of the inflammation. I was at um, Jason, oh, such a Jason Griffey. He did the Mi Meet Your Microbiome workshop in Perth and I flew over especially and I got a front row seat and I was like, oh, amazing. <laughs> and he was saying, and they've done studies, so the, the way that they test the pharmaceutical antidepressants is by injecting the mice with the lipopolysaccharides and then treating them with the antidepressants to see if they're effective. So if you're someone that's suffering with depression, maybe just have a little watch on your fat intake. It might not be appropriate for you. Mm. That's interesting. Mm, um, another con would probably be it's easy to overeat fat because it's not so big in the quantity. So if you eat too much fat, even if it's the good kind of fat, you'll probably get fat. So that's not such a great one. Um, and then how we talked about in the beginning stages, if we are cooking with the wrong kinds of fat, and if we're cooking, even if it's a good kind of fat, but to say like the olive oil, if that turns rented, then that's going to cause inflammation in the body as well. So fats can be anti-inflammatory, but they can also be pro-inflammatory. So it's good to do your research or work with someone to find out what you should be eating. And I think that's really important. I've invested in seeing a nutritionist. I think that there are some really great nutritionists and dietitians out there. Um, and again, it's an investment in your health. If having a couple of consults or appointments with a nutritionist or a dietitian um, can help put you on the right path and develop a way of eating that's suitable for you, that's going to save you so much time, energy and effort and bloating and potential symptoms because they'll be working with you on your unique makeup and situation. So what would it actually look like? Let's say somebody's listening to today's podcast and they're thinking, I really want to try this. This feels right for me. 
What would a plate or what would your day look like if you were eating low carb? The fat? lunch and dinner is probably the easiest meals to do because you can choose a high fat protein like salmon or the oily fish mackerel, or you can choose like some beef with good, like the scotch fillet steak, which is so yummy. And then making so steamed vegetables would definitely be better for a sea because cooked food is easier to digest. But otherwise, it can be a salad um, with some of those veggies that I mentioned before, like all your dark green leafy veg, your brassicas. You can put some avocado on your plate. The high fat nuts would be, say, macadamias. They are so delicious. Walnuts, pecans, and then your seeds, like your hemp seeds. So whatever you're making, and remembering that these ones are the omega-3s, they're often quite volatile with the oils. So you could cook your food, you could steam your veggies, make a stir fry, however you want to do it. And then after you've done that, you could sprinkle on the hemp seeds, you could sprinkle on the flax seeds, you could sprinkle on your sesame seeds. And then maybe like a little bit of drizzle of coconut oil or your oil of choice. And that can be your, your lunch. Breakfast is where a lot of people get stuck. And I know that you're not, you're not so great with eggs at the moment, but a lot of the eggs are a really easy way to start the day. It doesn't have to be boring and just having a couple boiled eggs or poached eggs, but you can think of all the different things you can do with your eggs. So you can make a nice omelet with a whole bunch of veggies inside, cooked in coconut oil. You can make, this is a bit fun, you can make little egg cupcake things. So beat your eggs like you would with scrambled egg or an omelet, and then you pour the mixture into those little muffin trays. And then you can add a whole bunch of veggies in there and then cook them so then they're all ready to go and they freeze really well. So that can be a time saver. If you don't want to do eggs, things like chia puddings are delicious. So you could soak your chia seeds in some coconut yogurt or coconut milk overnight, add in some blueberries. The fruit's not off limits. So the lower fructose fruits tend to go really well, which can be your blueberries, your strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. And they are fantastic for our microbiome with all the polyphenols in there. So that's really good. There is one thing about eating low carb, high fat. There isn't too much that crunches. And I do like texture. So sometimes maybe like kale chips can be nice because it gives you that bit of a crunch. And there's a thing called fat bread, which is made with a whole bunch of macadamia nuts and coconut oil. Third ingredient, which I forget now. And that can kind of give you... It's a nice way to replace. So replacing is always easier than taking away. So if you're used to having jam on toast for breakfast, maybe you could have some fat bread with a slather of almond butter. So that would be low-carb, high-fat. So changing it up there. Um, that sounds no. really cool. <laughs> There's smoke. probably an alternative for most meals. Like you can make cauliflower pizza and you can make that into low-carb, high-fat. You could make zucchini noodles with... Maybe an avocado sauce. That could be an alternative to pasta. There's so many options. It's just about getting creative and uh, and not worrying. I think uh, we can often want it, it to look like you know this picture perfect meal. And I'll be honest, I have disasters in the kitchen, but I'm always trying. And I would rather try and fail and try again and succeed than to never try. Um, one dish that I did that I do quite regularly for my breakfast, I love it. It's filling. It's got a, a good balance of vegetables and it's got the protein and the fat is I'll do a, st- a breakfast stir fry. I mean, it's just a stir fry basically. Yeah. So I'll get some good quality protein, whatever I feel like, my SIBO friendly vegetables, stir fry it all up. And then after it's cooked, I'll drizzle some oil on it. I'll add some nuts, mm. some seeds. Uh, so you get the crunch from them. It's so filling. You do not need to eat for hours after you've eaten that. And it's, yeah, it's a fave. And I put in um, fresh ginger and turmeric as well. So good uh, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory um, properties there as well. So good. That just reminded me of another thing that you could do is you could look at the different nuts and seeds that are high fat and make a version of a granola. I think you've got a recipe on your site, actually. I do. And then having that granola with coconut yogurt. That would be another one. Yeah. So one of my faves in summertime, and I do have to be careful with this because I do put on weight very easily. So I have to limit my servings with my granola. But my favorite is some of my granola, either my vanilla cinnamon granola or my chocolate granola. Mm. Um, Oh, it's so good. good. Uh, With some coconut yogurt and then a handful of fresh berries 
And if I'm feeling really like going out there, I might sprinkle it with some toasted coconut flakes or something like that. So it's good. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> it, it absolutely. I hope, whatever, <laughs> I hope all of you guys that are listening today are not hungry because we're making you really hungry. <laughs> You're making me hungry. Um, it is so easy to overeat nuts. So just watching that one. So that's a, kind of a thing that I see quite a lot with SIBO people as well because it makes such an easy snack. But say for when you're following the biphasic diet, you only want to, want to have, say, 10 almonds, which is it takes a lot of restraint just to have 10 almonds. But you can make it easier to digest by soaking a lot of your nuts because the nuts contain, um, they enclose in something called phytic acid. They have a phytic acid layer, which is a natural insecticide to protect them from insects for eating them. But if you soak your nuts overnight, so for almonds, it's at least eight hours, you dissolve a lot of this phytic acid layer and it makes it easier to digest. When I had a, de- a food dehydrator, I would soak all my nuts as soon as I bought them and then re dehydrate re-dehydrate them and then you can store them easily like that otherwise you can just make them one to two days in advance and store them in the fridge i've actually got a dehydrator as my wish list for christmas for anybody that wants to buy it just putting it out there uh because i uh, i i find you know i really want one of them because it will make doing that a lot easier and as i continue to expand my food coming out of the elemental diet one of the things i'll do when i get to introducing nuts is i'll be soaking them so i'll make them more easily digested i'll blend them and blitz them so that they're so smaller. easy and you don't yeah. need to be as specific with recipes i used to make i, I sold my dehydrator i was so gutted when i left bali i'm buying a new one in Perth in a couple of weeks. So you can make so many crackers and you can get that crunch back. So I, a lot of what I used to do a lot was blend up a whole bunch of zucchini with flax seeds or sometimes psyllium husk. And that's all you need to do, spread it on a tray and you can break it open into crackers. I do seed crackers all the time and they're fantastic. Another thing for crunch, because I think crunch and saltiness is something you can often really miss, particularly if you've been someone that loved popcorn or crisps or anything like that, is um, taking the skin, say, from pork or chicken and baking that at a high Mm. temperature, rub some oil over it, season it with salt and pepper or any herbs and spices that you can tolerate, bake it at quite a high temperature, so like 220 degrees centigrade, which I think is about 450 Fahrenheit. Um, And it depends how long you need to cook it, depending on the thickness. Chicken skin is a lot quicker than pork skin. Uh, But that is the best salty, crackly, crunchy snack. And I survived off them in my early days with SIBO when I really missed crisps and just, not that I ate them very often, but because I couldn't have them, I really missed them. And so I actually made some pork crackling or pork rinds, as they're also known, just the other day when we got our pork box and there was some skin that I could Oh, cut my off. gosh, this is so yeah. good. <laughs> For the people that are, are currently where you were, eating chicken and eggs or chicken and zucchini, how do you go from there? Given we know the microbiome needs a diversity of plant-based foods to be well and healthy, but you're, you know, there'll be people listening who are like, I'm eating carrots and, and zucchini and I'm still reacting to them. There's no way I can think of introducing something else. How do we start stepping through until we can be eating a good range? Very slowly. Because if you try and introduce things in larger quantities, it might not be the food that is an issue. It could just be the quantity that you had. So with our microbiome, if you think of the Amazon rainforest versus a desert, an Amazon rainforest, when it's nice and healthy, it just works all by itself. It takes care of different things. It can withstand the storm. It can withstand some heat. Whereas in a desert, if you just go two different kinds of fern it's very fickle so the first bit of stress that comes along to it which could be from food or outside stress can cause the little microbiome to suffer so when our microbiome is stronger and then it's able to digest more foods better and then if you've not had something for a while just know that it will take some time to introduce because the body can stop releasing as many enzymes as it used to to deal with those foods a good kind of correlation is, say, someone that hasn't drunk alcohol in a long time and they go out and they have two glasses of wine, they'll probably be on their ear <laughs> because they just haven't been used to making the enzymes to break down the alcohol. And then when you aim for – I'm a big fan of 
introducing the 40 different plant foods per week, but a serving size of a teaspoon and up counts. So it doesn't mean that you have to pile up your plate with these veggies. It's just a little bit at a time. And you can also think about introducing prebiotics. So a really good one is partially hydrolyzed guaya gum. And this helps to feed your good bacteria, but it doesn't feed the bad bacteria. And a lot of people can start to tolerate more foods when they look after their bacteria with prebiotics, like this partially hydrolyzed guaya gum. And just a little bit of a time. Yeah. And as someone that's doing that, I'm reintroducing the foods after the elemental diet and I'm going really slow and steady. I'm not, I'm doing one food a day um, and I'm, and I've picked the foods that I know were fine for me as well so that I can, I can build a good base and then go from there. But literally it's small quantities in small portions. So, you know, you don't have to go and eat like, like you said, you don't have to go and eat a giant plate of food to get the benefit, a teaspoon and even if you have to just stick with that teaspoon for a month, then that's fine. Slow and steady, will, slow and steady. You will get better with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very, if someone's finally managed to get rid of their SIBO, it can be very scary if they do have a flare or if they do have bloating. Not every time that we get bloated means that we're back to square one with SIBO. Sometimes it can just be a little bit of inflammation. Sometimes it can be a little bit of gas and it's, quite normal so even me like my digestive system is pretty nice and strong now but I make this delicious curried lentil soup with onions and garlic and it's tasty as and if I eat too much of it too many days in a row I'm going to get gassy and I'm going to get a bit bloated it doesn't mean that I have SIBO it's just I overdid it a little bit so if you have a reaction to something it doesn't mean that you can never have it again just take it out for a little bit of time get back to the foods that you know make you feel good and then you can try it again later in a smaller quantity and then you start to develop a positive reinforcement around food. So you start to feel that food is capable of making you feel good. And then your body will relax around it as well. Because when our bodies are relaxed with food, which is why as well I, don't, I recommend not eating at your desk and not taking emails, not doing these things that stimulate. Because if we eat when we're stressed, we're very dominant in our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight and flight stress response. And when that is firing a lot stronger, our parasympathetic nervous system gets shut down, which is our rest and our digest. So then it doesn't even matter what food you're eating, your body's already kind of rejecting it and it's not going to digest it so well trying to foster that positive relationship with food. That's really important. Something that I'm doing at the moment as I reintroduce all of the foods back into my diet is a lot of positive affirmations. So when I'm preparing my food, I'm telling myself, look at this beautiful nourishment, look at the greatness that is coming into my body, look how wonderful this is, you know, really positive words and language. That I'm, I'm just saying it to myself in my mind. And then when I sit down to eat my food, I'm looking at it, I'm smelling it, I'm not sitting at my desk, I'm sitting down at the table and my focus is on eating. I'm chewing really, really slowly because I want to support the digestion. But I'm still doing that mantra around this is health, this is vitality, this is brilliant nutrition. Now, on the first day coming out of the elemental diet, I only had chicken. I had chicken in a broth, really overcooked chicken. And then the first vegetable I had was pureed carrot and I had a quarter of a carrot. So it wasn't like it was a huge amount. But I still, and I, and I felt confident that those foods would be fine, but I still chewed incredibly well, even though it was pureed. Uh, there wasn't anything to chew, but I just got that digestive process happening. And the whole time I was like, look at this nutrition. This is beautiful. This is healing so me. Good. My little bacteria are going to be so happy that this is coming <laughs> in. And I think that can be a yeah. missing piece for many people that when you sit down to eat, yeah. you approach it with fear and, and just of being afraid of what's going to happen rather than flipping it on its head and saying, this is my life force. This food is nourishing me. This is going to be great. And I think we can often talk ourselves out of a flare by approaching our food in a calmer state and more open state. Even deep breathing. There have been studies on how deep breathing can reduce bloating in 10 minutes. 
So when you get your body used to this deep abdominal breathing, that really puts you into your rest and your digest parasympathetic nervous system, and that can be enough to digest and decrease this bloating. And also how you said you're chewing your food really well. That's so good because you're breaking things down into the smaller, smaller, smaller pieces. So it's less work for everything else down the track. And also it's mixing in with your saliva, which is full of enzymes, which helps to break down the food even more. So if I, I always ask my clients how they're eating and a lot of them are just shoveling it in their mouth while they're doing all the emails and they're looking for digestive enzymes, they're looking for digestive aids. It's like, but you don't need that if you just sit down and eat it slowly. I bet some people do. But that can just solve so many issues right there. Because if you're wolfing it down, you're also swallowing air as you go, and that can cause bloating. Yeah, it's something I see with my clients as well. And it's something that we do a lot of work around, just slowing down, just taking the time to support your digestion. Now, for those people that don't process fats well, and there's definitely many of them out there in the SIBO community that just feel that fat just doesn't work for them, um, how do you work with your clients around that? Smaller bits, again, say with those enzymes I was talking about before, it can just be if you've been coming from the low-fat way for years and years and years, your body's not going to have those enzymes. So slowly introducing it and building your levels up. And then also supporting the liver and the gallbladder because they release bile. Bile helps to break down the fat. So if you find that you get nauseous after eating a high-fat meal, you might want to support the liver and gallbladder, which can be things like lemon water in the morning. That's fantastic. Any bitter foods, so your kale, your silver beet, parsley, they're amazing. And then if that's not enough, then you can look into herbal medicine. So wonderful herbs for the liver could include globe artichoke, St. Mary's thistle, schisandra, biplurum, and they'll all help to you to process. If you don't have a gallbladder, you're, you might not be able to tolerate it as well. The liver does produce some bile, but it's mostly the gallbladder that produces it. So just watching that one. We have talked about one of the negatives of a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet being potentially a, a negative impact on the microbiome. If somebody wants to see what their microbiome is doing, how do they go about that? So my favorite is the U-Biome test. So this is a test that anyone can order online. It's in the States. I love, 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 love them, but they are quite slow. <laughs> so do order it ahead of time. And I recommend the time-lapse kit. So it's a gut explorer one that you want. So a single test is $89, US dollars. a kit of three is $179. And so then you can test your starting point, maybe test like three months later, maybe test six months later, so you can see if your treatment plan is working. And I really like this one because it tests your bacteria at the DNA level. So a lot of the stool tests that we do, they're a lot more clunky for one, a little messy, but they don't tell you the diversity as much as you have. So you might just see your lactobacilli plus, 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 or your bifidobacterium plus, plus. So that shows you that you might have high levels, but it doesn't necessarily tell you in relation to everything else because it's not, have, it's not great to have almost all your bacteria as lactobacilli. Back to my example of having two ferns in the desert. You might have great ferns, but you need the rest of the plants to make everything work by itself. And it's really good. It's really accurate. It's very easy. It's kind of like if you see in CSI how they use those little cotton buds, and that's all you need to do. You just need to do a little wipe on your toilet paper. And it's so easy. It's a little bit trickier to interpret. So again, you might need to work with a practitioner on that one. But so much information from there. And if you'd like to learn more about testing your microbiome with the Ubome Explorer test, I did a whole episode with the amazing Dr. Jason Horlick. Uh, that's episode 75. And we actually show via a video uh, and the podcast audio my actual test results. So we go through all of the bacteria that, you know, the little families and the groups of bacteria that were that are living in me. And I will be retesting uh, my bacteria. Uh, I'll do it a couple of times. And I look forward to sharing with you guys what my results are. And fingers crossed there and on the improve because when I did the first test it was 62% diversity so I've definitely got a lot of room for improvement. Now if somebody is interested in connecting with you perhaps they would like to do some online consulting with you or joining one of your coaching uh, sessions how can they get in touch with you? 
So the best way is through my website, which is just www.kirstenswales.com. I put so much information on there about working with me, what it would look like, FAQs. And then I'm most active on Instagram. I was very resistant to it a while, but I'm really enjoying it now. So I post on there most days with lots of information thing. And it's pretty much all about IBS and SIBO and digestive health. So I give lots of good nuggets in there. And my, you can find me through my contact page as well if you want some direct help. And my assistant can help book in appointments. It's super easy. I streamline all my systems. So we work online. If we're doing one-on-ones, it's through Zoom. And then I also take care of product sourcing and delivery because a lot of my clients are mover abouters like me. So wherever they are in the world, I just need an address that they'll be at within two or three days and I can organize that, which helps with the continuity of treatment because if you maintain that continuity and consistency, you're going to get better so much quicker. And then in testing, I organize as well. I've got my system set up worldwide because we're doing it for quite a while i love it i love what i do it's so good that's great and for the for the people that don't have anyone around them to know that they can still get testing they can still get supplements or herbs um through you then then that i would imagine alleviates a lot of anxiety and for those people that would like to spend some time with both you and i in person we have got the world's first SIBO retreat coming up in 2019 which is super exciting so july 2019 we've got some tentative dates out there uh do head to my website thehealthygut.com where you'll see the link under events um but uh, we are coming together, we're joining forces to put on a, a, an amazing retreat for our fellow seaboers from wherever you are in the world to come together in Bali. Uh, we've got the most beautiful looking uh, venue oh, where there's stunning. a pool and all yeah. sorts of different accommodation options and we will be running a retreat over a couple of days where we will uh, be doing some education, lots of relaxation, lots of pampering, SIBO delicious food on offer and uh, really a vacation where you can come away and know that you'll be totally looked after with people that know exactly what it's like to have gut issues. So good. The venue is amazing. It's so calm and peaceful and it just feels so luxurious. There's space for us to do yoga. There's space for us to eat our meals together. And it's really close to the rest of the hustle and bustle, but you still get that peace and quiet. And Bali, so we're going to be doing all the foods and all organic and SIBO friendly. But it's also really easy to eat out here with SIBO because we have so many healthy restaurants. It's just near Changu, which is been described as like another suburb of Australia. So we can get our almond milk lattes and avocado toast and it's, it's really, really good. Bali is amazing. I love it. It is. So we are um, capping the numbers on this so there won't be unlimited numbers just because the venue is capped in the number of beds available. So if you are interested in coming along to the SIBO retreat in Bali in July 2019, reach out to myself or Kirsten and let us know. We do have a list of people that are interested and we'll make sure that you are the first to know when tickets go on sale for the event so that you can get in uh, before anybody else does. But do let us know because we would hate for you to miss out if you're really keen on joining us. Uh, We'll have the information on the event, pricing, the confirmed dates uh, up very shortly. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the Healthy Gut Podcast today and talking all about the low-carb, high-fat way of eating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I love to share. It's really good. You made me a bit hungry, so I'm probably going to make some food. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. Although I just just ate my high-fat meal before, so I'll be free for a while. (laughs) Amazing. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks to everybody for tuning in today. Don't forget that you can watch the recording of today's interview. Just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast where you will be able to access today's show and a link to the video and you can access all the podcasts that are now available. Don't forget that as a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast, you get a free transcription of today's episode and all other episodes. It's absolutely free to join 
All you need to do is just sign up when you head to the podcast page. You'll get an email every week when the podcast airs and you'll get access to all of the transcriptions from season two. And don't forget to come and say hi. We are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Twitter and Google+. Plus. I absolutely love hearing from you. And finally, we are coming to the end of season two of the Healthy Gut Podcast. So we'll be taking a little break where we get ready for season three. And this is where I need your help. What would you like me to feature in terms of topics or guests for season three? So drop me an email at Rebecca at thehealthygut.com and let me know. It could be any topic that you would like me to cover that I haven't already covered. Or if I have already covered it and you'd like more, then let me know. I really love to hear your feedback. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening.